Hi, and welcome to 8.6 Elastic Potential Energy. In this lesson, students will be able to calculate the elastic potential energy stored in a spring. So work being done on a spring. As you exert a force on a spring over a distance, the spring stretches or compresses. You are doing work on the spring, but the force changes. So it's a little bit more complicated than just pushing on a box because in this situation, the force was the same. Now we're pushing on a spring. So here's the spring at equilibrium. And as you push on the spring, you're doing work because you're exerting a force over a distance, right? So I'm pushing on the spring. It's now more compressed. And as I go through that distance, right, force and distance, as I go through that distance, the force changes. So we'll call like that the final force, and you could have an initial force. So initially, let's say you're not pushing on it, and then you push on it more and more and more, and you have to push harder and harder and harder because the, the spring is pushing back on you more. So the force goes from zero to a greater force, uh, and it ranges between there. So how are we going to handle that? when we try to do the work formula. Work is equal to F times D, right? So what do we plug in over here? Zero or what? Like, what are we gonna plug in? Let's see. So yep, W is equal to FD. And we're gonna use the average of these two. So initially it was zero, and then you get to some maximum force. So we'll use the average of those two um, and in our work formula. So what does that look like? Well, the average is just the two numbers added together and then divided by two because there's two numbers there. So the initial is actually going to be zero because you're not pushing on the spring and then you start pushing on the spring and the force increases. So initially it's zero, which means that the average force is the, the final force divided by two or one half times the final force. And I this looks like the force of friction, right? FF, we've seen that before, but this is really the final force that you're pushing on on the spring so i uh, just wanted to note it that way which looks a little clunky but i'm just doing it to be specific here so we're replacing the average force with one half of the final force because that that force varies all right so we have the uh i've made this is this is the hook's law equation right really this should be fs but it's the final spring force, right? So, and I didn't write, I didn't even want to write, okay, maybe I'll make the final spring force. Oh, that looks like maximum static friction. So the subscripts are a little weird, but I'm just using this to explain that we're going to plug in Hooke's law now. So for the final spring force, that's equal to K, the spring constant times X. So let's plug that in over here. Okay, so we made that change. Now we have kx times d, remember, because we're doing the force times the distance. Well, we already said the distance is actually x, all right? The distance is x. So we could replace that d with an x, and then we have an x times x. We have an x squared. Hmm. So the work you do in pushing a spring or pulling on it is equal to one half times k x squared and that's actually the work you're doing is being stored in the spring as elastic potential energy so it's very similar to the work kinetic energy theorem and yesterday we even did like a work gravitational potential energy or i should say two lessons ago when we did gpe and we just derived the equation for the uh, potential energy in a spring. The elastic potential energy equation is one half kx squared. And that's where it's really coming from. It's the average, the average force, it's one of those x's, times the distance, the other x. The force times the distance, the work. The work being done on the spring is equal to the potential energy stored in that spring. So here's the formal definition. The work done in stretching or compressing a spring is equal to the potential energy stored in the spring. Hey, that's what I just said. What do you think the units should be for elastic potential energy? 
That's right, joules. Any kind of energy, we can measure it in joules. So that's good. Okay, and then the equation we just derived. 1 half kx squared. Now, the reference table does do PES like this. Sometimes I'll write it as EPE. All right, elastic potential energy. But uh, really, the S stands for spring. All right, so anytime you see spring, you might have to use this equation. We already talked about what K is in the previous lesson and X. Remember, elastic potential energy is a type of mechanical energy. All right, so that's important to remember. So where is that formula? We saw it in the previous lesson. It's over here. Uh, wait, where is it? Oh my gosh, do you see it? Okay, here it is. Boom, this one right here. Okay, so we have the two spring equations. Very nice, beauty. So what is the relationship between the elastic potential energy exerted on a spring and the elongation of the spring? Pause the video, think about it. What do you think this graph is gonna look like? And what would you call that relationship? Pause the video. All right, it is an exponential relationship. The elongation is X and the X is being squared. So it's exponential with the potential energy. So the more you stretch it, that's really gonna increase your elastic potential energy. All right, now we have a force first elongation graph. It says, what does the area under the curve represent on an FS versus X graph? Hmm, pause the video and think, this is a good critical thinking question here. What do you think? Pause, really pause the video. If you want a challenge, try to figure out what the area under that curve represents. Pause the video, come on, you could do it. All right, so the area under the curve, in this case, is a triangle, right? Because as you stretch it out, it's a direct relationship, right? We talked about this yesterday with Hooke's Law. As you stretch it out, the force increases. So you'll always get this triangle looking shape if it's a nice spring. So it's one half base times height. That's the area for a triangle. Well, the base is X, right? The elongation, the base of the triangle, and the height is the force. So we could switch those two because the commutative property of multiplication. So it's one half force times X. Okay, that's looking kind of like a formula we just saw. Let's see, hold on. So we just said that the potential energy stored in the spring is one half KX squared, which we wrote like this while we were deriving it, right? And remember, this KX thing came from Hooke's law. So we could actually replace in the potential energy formula, you could replace KX with FS, the force in the spring. You could write it like that, that's totally valid. So you take the force in the spring, you multiply it by X, you divide it by two, that'll tell you what the potential energy stored in the spring is. This is actually a handy equation. It's not given to you in the reference table. So if you want on that reference table, you could write in this version of the formula next to it. That's good to know. All right. Now keep in mind, look at that. Wow. So they're the same thing. So does that mean, oh my goodness. Yes. The area is equal to the potential energy in the spring. This area here is the potential energy in that spring. Wow. Very nice. How about this? What's the slope of that line? Do you remember from the previous lesson? It's FS divided by X, right? The force divided by the, divided by the elongation, so it's gonna be equal to K from this formula, Hooke's Law. So this is a powerful graph here. I like this graph, the force first elongation graph. The slope is equal to the spring constant, and the area under the curve is equal to the potential energy in the spring. So we've actually seen something like this before in a force versus distance graph. Hmm, hmm, force versus distance, right? So we said the area was equal to the work done measured in joules. So we've seen, this was like from 8.1b, no, 8.1a, all right, the very beginning of this unit. Uh, well, what happens if it's the spring force and the distance is the distance that you stretch it? That's what the, the graph that we just saw, right? So the area is equal to the work done on the spring, which is equal to 
the change in the potential energy in the spring. All right, so just driving it home that the work done is equal to the change in the potential energy. And if you wanted to be fancy and graph it, you could calculate the area under that curve to figure out that energy. So right into example one, we've got two examples here. It says a spring with a spring constant of five newtons per meter is compressed a distance of 0.6 meters. What is the total elastic potential energy stored in the compressed spring? And what would the potential energy be if you double the compressed distance? Whoa. All right, pause the video and try this one on your own. So we'll start by writing down the given information, the spring constant, five newtons per meter, and it's compressed a distance of 0 0.6 meters. And they're looking for the potential energy stored in the spring. So we want to write our equation. PES is equal to one half KX squared. A lot of new variables being thrown at you here, right? So like this is only the second day we're dealing with K and X, but hopefully you did the practice and you're a little bit more comfortable with the idea that this is a new thing, right? So the spring constant, how stiff is that spring? It takes five Newtons to compress it one meter. That's not a very stiff spring. And X is 0 0.6. We're only compressing it 0.6 meters. Don't forget to square it. How much potential energy is stored in that spring? I would say it's 0 0.9 joules of energy. Nice, so that's for part A. For part B, it says, what would the potential energy be if you doubled the compressed distance? So this becomes, for part B, X would be like 1.2, because it's 0 0.6 times uh, 2. But I don't want to calculate this whole thing again. Let's just figure this out by looking at the equation. So what would the potential energy be if the distance is doubled? So we're going to like double the x we're doubling the x and remember the x is being squared and i can't just like put a number on one side of the equation without balancing out this side of the equation right this is one of those relationship type problems that we've seen in the past all right so if i have a two that's being squared on this side two squared is four to balance out the equation i need to multiply the potential energy by four on this side and then it would be like the equation would be balanced out right so what you do is you just take your previous answer and you multiply it by four and that's all you have to do so four times 0 0.9 joules gives you 3.6 joules of energy so it went from 0.9 all the way to 3.6 just by doubling uh the compressed distance um yeah that's pretty sweet because it's an exponential relationship right nice 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 you could you could have calculated you change it to 1.2 plug in the numbers and gotten the same thing either way works <clears throat> all right example two a 25 newton force is required to hold a stretched spring 0.5 meters from its rest position so you're holding onto this thing and stretching out the spring 0.5 meters what is the potential energy stored in the spring and what would the potential energy be if you have the compressed distance pause the video and try this one out it's a little different it's a little different all right so here they're telling us 25 newtons of force so they're telling us the force that's being applied and if you make like this free body diagram here you have the, uh, this is actually showing, this is really the applied force. I don't really like how they labeled that. I, I ripped that uh, image off of somebody else. Uh, let's see. Let me, oh, I don't even need the spring there. Who cares about the spring? What's happening is you're pulling on the spring with an applied force of 25 Newtons. And you're it's at rest there. You're holding it there in that position. So if it's at rest, that means all the forces must be balanced out and the spring is exerting a force back on it. Because if there was no 
force exerted by the spring, and that's the only force, then you would accelerate to the right. But the, the spring is balancing out your applied force. And this is actually where the spring force is, right, going that way. So they, I think they kind of labeled it in the wrong direction there. But it doesn't really matter because they're equal to each other. So it ends up being the same thing anyway. So that's just a little extra information. Oh, my gosh, Mr. Nagel, you're really trying to stretch this to 20 minutes, aren't you? Here we go. Uh, what else? X is equal to 0 0.5 meters. And it says, what is the potential energy stored in the stretch, stretched spring? Okay. If you were to use the equations given to you in your reference table, only the two in your reference table, you might say, okay, boom, I want to use this one but I don't have K. They didn't tell me what the spring constant was. Then I would tell you, oh, first you gotta do Hooke's law. First do FS is equal to KX. This is a tool that's given to you on the reference table and you could actually solve for K. Um, so you divide by a half and yeah, you could figure out that the spring constant is 50 Newtons per meter. And now we're ready to do this. This is a classic way to try to trick you because it's like, oh, I don't have the spring constant. Don't forget, Hooke's law is a thing. Like it's not just this equation when we're dealing with springs. You can try to figure it out given this information uh, if you wanted to do it that way. But there is that other version of the formula uh, that we showed in the previous slides there. So you get, 6.25 joules. Now, remember, you also have this in your tool belt, but it's like hidden. It's one half the force times X. That's it, not X squared. I know you're gonna wanna plug that. Sometimes I do that too. It was like, oh, okay, X squared. No, no, no. In this version of the formula, remember it's because FS is equal to kx, right? This turns into that, times this other x over here, and that's where the x squared comes from over here. So don't, don't fall into the trap. If you're trying to be fancy and using this equation, muscle memory might make you go like that. That's, that's, not, that's not the right equation, all right? That's why if you plan on using this equation, I would highly recommend writing it in your reference table um in the correct fashion so let's just make sure that we get the same answer we should because physics is cool like that you know and then 25 that's a 2 not a 25 25 times x is 0 0.5 and look at that the potential energy stored in the spring is still 6.25 joules so either way, if you want to be fancy and use this version of the equation that's not in your reference table, that's totally your prerogative. I do like working out this particular problem um, by showing like, hey, you could use Hooke's law to figure out the spring constant first. This is given to you in your reference table and then use that spring constant in the other formula that's given to you in your reference table. So I like to, uh, utilize the things that are given to you in the reference table because I know that's like your safety blanket um, and this one's not in there. So yeah, a lot of fun, good stuff. Oh yeah, I forgot about this. So uh, um, this was this is reminiscent for me. I actually used to, my family used to have a TV that looked something like this, believe it or not, with the knobs and everything. And uh, so in the extension activities folder, there's going to be a video of Wiley e. Coyote and the Roadrunner, and it shows like the different energy and he's like messing around with the spring and stuff like that. It's kind of interesting. <clears throat> and then you could also think about, uh, there's another video about pole vaulting in the extension video. Uh, so this person's running, right? They have kinetic energy and they transfer all of that kinetic, well, not all of it. They're still moving at that point but they're not moving as fast over here, right? So they're going sprinting, 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 a lot of kinetic energy, and then their body slows down a little bit. They lose some kinetic energy, but it's stored as elastic potential energy in the pole, right? It doesn't have to be a, a spring. 
you could still have elastic potential energy in any kind of like bendy type of thing. And then the pole straightens out. So there's no more potential energy in the spring. Where did that energy go? Into gravitational potential. Look how high they are over there. They have a lot of gravitational potential energy. And at the top of their flight, their vertical velocity is zero. They might, they should be moving forward a little bit, but most of it is gravitational potential energy. So really good pole vaulters are good at physics. <laughs> All right, there's another video in there for that. And then bungee jumping, another cool example of energy transfer. So before jumping, the bungee cord is relaxed and you have a high potential energy or a height above. While falling, before passing the rest length of the bungee cord, the bungee cord is still relaxed. The person's getting faster and they're going down, so they're losing gravitational potential energy. Then, luckily, their cord is there, right? So the while falling, after passing the rest length of the bungee cord, the cord starts getting tighter. The bungee cord is stretching and starts exerting upward force on the person, which slows them down luckily right so that's good and you're storing that energy in the bungee cord as elastic potential energy it's like a rubber band before rising up the bungee cord is fully stretched so they're at rest for a split second at the bottom here split second the bungee cord is fully stretched and exerts a stronger upward force on the person the person stops just before rising up so think about the energy if you want you could pause the video and think about like the gravitational potential energy the kinetic energy the elastic potential energy where is it the most where is it the least so here it's all gpe here you're losing gpe but gaining kinetic energy because you're getting faster as you fall down you're losing height then you're still losing your height. See how this person is still going downward, right? And you're losing kinetic energy. Now, before you were getting faster because you're falling, but now you're slowing down. The, the spring, not spring, but the bungee cord is slowing you down. So if you're losing height and you're losing speed, where is that energy going? The energy is being stored in the bungee cord. You're gaining elastic potential energy. And here it's all elastic potential energy. And there is a video in the extension folder about the top 10 greatest bungee jump places. So that's pretty cool too. Oh, and then there's one more video. All right. So this is a video that shows uh, like the physics of garage doors, not really the physics of garage doors. It's actually a video that shows you how to fix uh, the springs of a garage door yourself but do not attempt this on your own. This is for like training professional people who are gonna go out and do this as a job. And in the beginning of the video, it says like, actually don't do this. So, but I wanted to put it in there. Don't try this on your, seriously, don't try this because the springs are very dangerous. There's a lot of stored energy in that spring and it could, it could maim or kill you, seriously. So I'm, I'm telling you, don't mess with the garage door springs, but, if you want, you could think as you watch the video, the springs help open the door. Where does that energy come from is the question. And you can see the person. They're exerting a force over a distance. They're doing work on this spring. And that energy is being stored in that spring. And that spring, by you, it's attached to this rod, which is attached to a pulley, which attaches to the garage door. Uh, that that force that energy that they ha have stored in the spring helps to open the garage door it's actually kind of interesting so if you want you can check that video out as well anyway that's about it thanks for watching and have a great day